You're watching the West Block on Global. Welcome back. The coronavirus pandemic is forcing us to rethink almost everything we do. The pandemic intersects with another moment in time, more a movement, where inequality and systemic racism have been called out. Both are now forcing us to confront our assumptions, the way we live and the way we design our cities. One person who spent a lot of time thinking about what makes cities tick is Richard Florida, a professor at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. Welcome to the West Block, Richard. It's great being with you, Farah. Thanks for having me. I want to dig deep into both these issues, but let's begin with COVID-19 and what our cities are going to look like in the future. And let's begin with work. What is the effect of people working from home and what's going to happen to all those office towers in downtown cores? Well, the first thing is that cities are going to be fine. Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and Winnipeg and Edmonton, they're all going to be fine. Big cities have survived far worse pandemics and crises in the past. And the force of urbanization is just greater than infectious disease. When it comes to work, a lot more of us who work in knowledge jobs are going to be working remotely. About 40 percent of the Canadian workforce is working remotely today. And about half those folks will continue to work remotely. So, yeah, we're going to need less offices. And that's a good thing. You know, if more people stay working remotely, that means fewer people on the roads, less traffic congestion, that congestion and less emissions in cleaner cities. So when we talk about getting around, though, uh, like transit, there are people who are who are scared right now, Richard, to get on transit, to, to get on planes, for that matter. How are we going to get around? How is that going to change? Well, the data is unclear as to whether the virus really spreads on transit, especially if we're socially distanced and wearing a mask. That said, it does, sometimes things data don't matter. Science doesn't matter. Uh, people are scared of transit, not just in Canada, not just in North America, but when China came back online, a society that's very used to getting on subways and trains, ridership went dramatically down. So, look, we got to be careful because we, we don't want all those folks getting into private cars and driving to work. The congestion we experience in our cities and regions will be astronomical. Hmm, OK, uh, now we're talking about a driving. That's one thing. But but the cities itself, like when we talk about culture, right, people aren't going to restaurants. They're not going to uh, concerts the same way they were art galleries. What happens to the vibrancy that exists in cities now? Uh, the the cultural, artistic and creative economy has just been decimated by this crisis, you know, Artists and musicians and performers can't work. There is simply no work for them. And, and some estimates for the United States, for example, suggest that as many as half of all performing artists have been put out of a job. What if we set up locally sourced platforms for local culture in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Edmonton, in Winnipeg, in Montreal? So neighborhood groups, community groups, they can hire local artists and local chefs to create a socially distanced block party. Maybe put performers and artists on every street corner to create some liveliness in our communities this summer. But it's time to activate local culture. And there's an opportunity there to get us away from mass produced culture and back to the business of supporting local arts and local culture. Hmm. Okay, I want to move our discussion now to something else. I mean, your last book was about polarization, and we now have this reckoning with anti-black racism, which has really uh, lifted the lid on inequality in our country. It's shown how out of control it is. So how, in your opinion, can we make the most of this moment right now? I think it's the most important moment of my life for cities. Uh, the COVID crisis focused attention on the inequities with regard to how much visible minorities were exposed to the virus in their communities. And now a wave of protests saying, you know, we're not going to stand for racial and social and economic injustice, police brutality. Uh, we want a better way of living. And that movement is a movement not just of visible minorities and frontline workers. It is a movement of knowledge workers, professional workers, white Canadians, multicultural Canadians. It is multicultural and multi-class. People standing up and say, we want better cities. So the opportunity we have now is to make our cities better, to build them back better in ways that are more inclusive, that create more opportunity and more justice for all Canadians, but in also ways that are healthier and safer and more resilient going forward. You know, this hits hard at me. The, the reason I became an urbanist was in 1967, I'm born in Newark, New Jersey. My hometown exploded into civil unrest. Uh, black people then protesting police brutality, uh, racial injustice. And as a little boy, I was asking my mom and dad, why are there tanks in our streets? Why is the 
Army National Guard occupying. Why, why is there such prejudice against racial minorities? And to see it happen really hits hard. Look, I think, but the difference today is this is a multicultural, multi-class movement. It is white, black, Latino, Asian, immigrant, new Canadian. Uh, it's rich and poor. It's knowledge worker and service workers all saying enough is enough. So I actually think this is a great moment. Uh, maybe maybe COVID helped to prepare this moment, but the outpouring of civic awareness about racial and class injustice provides hope, a, a silver lining that we can rebuild our cities in ways and suburbs and communities and countries in ways which are far more racially economic inclusive. Inclusiveness and resilience, those two words, inclusiveness and resilience have to be in underscored as the way forward for our city, suburbs, and urban areas in the future. So let me ask you that. How long is this window for change? Look, I think we have a couple of years to get to do things right. And, and what we need in Canada is to really to take a big step forward. We have an opportunity here to attract talented people from around the world, to build our cities and suburbs back better, to really develop a new deal between our federal government, our provinces, and our cities. One thing that's happened is our mayors, our premiers, and our prime minister, and our federal government have worked together. It is time for a real new deal for cities. We've talked about this for a long time in this country. Uh, provinces, cities, and the federal government working together to build more inclusive cities and suburbs where all Canadians, regardless of race, color, creed, or socioeconomic status, can have a true Canadian dream and true opportunity. That's got to be our go-to move going forward. Okay, I'll leave it there. It's been a pleasure. Richard Florida, thank you. It's always a delight to be with you, Farah. Thank you for having me. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us on The West Block. I'm Farah Nasser, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.